Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's HBO's long-awaited original series of Watchmen starring Regina King, Lil Gossett Jr., Don Johnson, only to name a few. Season one, episode one, entitled It's Summertime and We're Running Out of Ice. I'll describe how this series is different from the comic books. That's all coming up next. It's Bunny. <laughs> so this series is based upon some of the characters of the original DC comic book original series. It takes place about 30 to 34 years after the comic book series ends. We have in the United States contemporary setting where mask outlaws and mask superheroes have been outlawed because of so much violence and so much turbulence. But we do have a group premise who wants to start a revolution to stop this outlaw, but then we have people who want to stop the revolution from even happening. As time persists, we have a white supremacy group who are followers of the Rojak, and they wear homemade Rojak masks. And after a while, they've named themselves the Seventh Calvary. They commence to having attacks on police officers, so much so that the policemen have to wear masks themselves in order to protect their identity. This season, we have an estimated nine episodes, so I'm so excited to get involved with this series. It is a little bit of a remix from the original comics, so try not to base this series based upon previous movies or previous interpretations of the comics. This is a totally different interpretation of Watchmen. So let's get started about the recap and the review of this episode. I'll make sure as I recap these episodes to introduce the characters as they are introduced in the series. The opening scene, we see a young boy. He's looking at an old Western movie. And it's the old Western style to where when you watch the movie, you had to have a pianist to accompany the movie with the music. But as he's watching it, we see that it's two horsemen, one that's going after a white man in a suit, in a sheriff's, sheriff's suit. And the person that's doing the chasing is cloaked with a hoodie. And you cannot see who this person is. When he catches up with the person, he rounds them up, pulls them down and we have all white people that come out of this church and they're wondering what's going on who is this and a little white boy says that is deputy uh, Bass Reeves I had to look at the name Bass Reeves and it's a black man he unveils himself and he's very proud and he's saying that this this man this sheriff is not worthy to be a sheriff because he is stealing cattle so I must take him in and of course the crowds people are very excited about that that justice has been served and as we see in the shot the pianist that's playing the music to go along with the, with the movie is a black woman who is in tears and she's playing the piano and we don't know why she is in tears. A few seconds later, we see a black man run in and he's saying, we've got to go, we got to get out of here. She grabs the little boy and they are in a rush to get out of wherever they are. And as they're preparing to leave, the the father is holding the son, running with him, and the mother is following along. They then get out of the building area, and it is chaos, it is war, it's shooting going on. We see that there are Klansmen that have shot a lot of black people, and it's just chaotic, a lot of things that are going on. They are dodging bullets, and we see that it is Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it is 1921. So it's back and forth with the war and the shooting. They sneak into a small cabin area, and another gentleman says, I don't have enough room, I can't. And so he says, just take my son. He puts the son in the uh, what looks to be as a um, chariot, couldn't think of the name, a chariot, and he places them into the chariot, and they realize that they don't have enough room to go with them, and he tells the son, you know, take care, we're coming in, we're coming right after you, we're going to be right behind you, just be safe and keep your head low. 
They proceed to take off, and as they take off, there's a lot of different explosions that's happening. So we can conclude that his parents didn't survive because the area where they just left explodes. We then see a few seconds later that the little boy comes to, and he sees that the horse chariot is completely destroyed. The people that were riding along with him in the chariot are deceased. And he hears a baby a few feet away that's crying and he picks up the baby and he says, everything's gonna be okay. And as he turns around far in the distance, he sees that that con complete city is demolished and it is engulfed with flames. Then cut to more of a current location where we see a white man he's in a truck and he's listening to hip-hop music and he's driving and we can tell he's either a little intoxicated or high by the way that he looks as he's driving and he sees the cop lights behind him and he gets pulled over and he's like man and as he gets pulled over we see a cop come to the window and he says you know where are you going have you been drinking and he flashes a light at the driver and the driver says you know I'll get you what you need the license and rest registration but get the light out of my face and as a matter of fact remove your mask and the cop says excuse me and we can see that it is a black officer and he's covered from the eyes down so we do see that the, the cop's face is covered and as the man that's in the truck, truck, the white guy that's in the truck, he leans over to get the license and registration, the cop notices that there's a mask of some sort in the glove compartment. He then goes back to his cop car to call in what he sees, and he says that he needs backup because as the driver was getting the registration, he notices a Rojak, I think it's pronounced Rojak or Rojak, um, a mask in the compartment and he says are you sure he's hearing the feedback are you sure that's what you saw do you see any explosives do you see any weapons he's just like no but I need clearance to get this gun and what we notice in the car is that he has to request clearance to unlock his weapon so there's clearly been some changes to where he can't just have his weapon out he can't just use it he has to get clearance for this gun to be unlocked in the car for him to get and as he's making this call and he finally gets clearance for the gun to come out the shooter just starts shooting at the cop and all of the bullets spray him from the driver's side and we see the white guy get out of the out of the car out of his truck and he has on the mask letting the audience know that the officer's concerns were correct and that he did have that mask. We then see a play, a theater play, and they are performing the play Oklahoma. And we see that the entire cast is black and the audience is mixed with white people and black people and they're looking at it and they're enjoying the play and there's a little bit of a hip hop undertones and beats to the play and they're looking at it and they, they look like they're enjoying the play. And as he's watching it, we have a close up of a particular character that's watching the play and we have a mass officer that comes to him, whispers something in his ear, he looks at him so we can get an idea that he's informing him of a cop that's been shot. He goes down the theater hall and then we do see the cop. He is in a hospital-esque facility where he is recuperating and, he, and they talk to each other and they say, is this Calvary? And another cop says, well, it could be, but we're not sure. So he says, wow, you know, Calvary, I can't believe they're starting this stuff up again. So we can get an idea that there is information about Calvary, and this is something that's been ongoing because the cop automatically makes the assumption, this is probably Calvary. Is it Calvary? We then learn that this person's name is Chief Judd. And Chief Judd is the one that was informed that a cop was shot. So you then see masked officers, they go to this house and they go to this location and when they knock on the door, it is a black woman and Chief Judd says, you know, I'm informing you that your husband has been shot. Did you tell anyone that 
your husband was a cop and she says no of course not it's against the rules and he says well what do you tell people when he leaves the house and he goes to do what he needs to do while he's on duty and she says if somebody asks where he is or what's going on I just tell them that he has night courses night college courses that he's been going to and that's it I haven't said anything else and Chief Judd says well we'll just let everybody know he was carjacked as he was going to night school and of course the wife is just very distraught about that and she's huffing and puffing like oh, I can't believe that we have to make up a story and she says well why do we have to say that why can't we just tell the truth and he says you know as certain policies and procedures we have to tread lightly on what information that we put out so that's what we're gonna do I know you hate my guts but let's just keep it under the wraps and we're gonna tell everybody that he was carjacked and killed on his way to night school. We then cut to a classroom where we see Regina King's character. And in the background on the chalkboard, if you're observant, you see, you know, it's career day, welcome Miss Abar. And she's displaying and showing how she makes her mooncakes. And they say, well, what did you do before that? And where are you from? And she talks about how she grew up in Vietnam outside of Saigon. And the teacher says, well, were you there before it was acclaimed a state? So you know, wow, you know, this is areas being claimed a state. What is going on? And she says, yes, I used to live there and I grew up there and then eventually I was a cop. And when I was a cop, I was under the attack and this was the time and era where the cops didn't get to cover their faces. So I was in danger. I got shot. Um, I had to go to the hospital. They had to operate on me. They had to pull out my guts and the teacher's like, oh, that's too much for the class, for the kids. You know, she's giving it a look like, stop. So she says, well, that's what I used to do. I used to be a cop then, but now I own my bakery and I make moon pies. As she's talking about how she makes her moon cakes. We have someone, a little white boy who's in the classroom and he raises his hand and he says, well, did you get your, your bakery for red, from refredations? And you can tell she's insu insulted and she says, excuse me? He says, did you get your bakery from Red Redfordations? And we have another little boy who's also insulted by it and then starts to begin a fight with the white child. Then we see Mrs. Abar and we see the other child in the vehicle and he's holding up a tissue uh, that's bloody and it's evident that he's been in a fight. And she said, well, why did you pick a fight with the boy? And he says, well, he's racist. And she says, well, no, just because he asked that question doesn't mean that he's racist, but him asking that question, he's off to a really good start. And as they're, they're driving, we see this brief rainstorm, a very weird, squid looking like creatures that are coming from the sky and they're just splashing all over the vehicle and they're in the streets so much so that they can't drive they have to sit there and they have to wait for it to stop and as it abruptly starts it abruptly stops so this can either be some type of type of toxicity that's going on in the environment but that's something that they touch on and they as soon as it stops uh, Mrs. Abar get out, gets out the car and wipes off the, the windows and the vehicle and then they keep going forward. Mrs. Abar, she finally gets home and when she pulls up, we can see that there is a truck that has a process of cleaning this squid out of the street and so they're cleaning that up and as it passes by and she gets home, she greets her husband and we can see that they have a blended family but the children that they have are of different ethnicities. We have a white little girl, we have the young boy that was in the car with her of another ethnicity and she's calling her mom so we don't know if these are adopted children or she came about them in another way that we'll learn later. A husband says, you keep getting this, this page and the page reads, um, little big worm. What is that all about? And she says, well, I got to get back to the bakery. And he says, well, okay. And she says, pick up some other child after school. And he says, okay, I'll do that. And as she proceeds to leave to go to this bakery, we can already assume that this bakery-esque is just a cover up to what she really does. When she gets to this bakery area, there is an old gentleman in a wheelchair that says, is this your bakery? She says, yes. And he says, well, when do you think it will open? And she says, a couple of months from now. And he says, well, I'll just sit here and I can wait. 
she looks at him like he's some crazy person and she goes into the bakery she goes further into the back of the bakery where it is a coded entry which is 1985 i caught that <laughs> and she presses the code in and proceeds to change into this badass outfit where she's masked in the leather leather cloak and everything and she leaves in a different car and when she goes to that car she's walking and strutting on a mission looking for somebody specifically and she goes to this trailer park area and picks up a white guy and proceeds to whoop his butt and put him in the trunk of her car so she's obviously on a trail to something that we don't know yet he gets to the now police headquarters where they're watching a video on the screen where it is this terror-esque feel to it where they're giving an announcement that it is their mission that they wipe out the liberal views, the, the black people, anybody that's not on their side. And it's only so long before they make their big attack. And they said time is running out and they're chanting TikTok, TikTok. And it's one main person that's talking that has this Rojak esque mask on and as it zooms out it's actually a sea or a room full of people that have the same type of mask on and then we have um, Mr. Judd who says we thought that they were done we thought that Calvary um, was finished but in actuality they've been hibernating this whole time and they've been thinking of ways to clearly grow because they've grown so this threat has has heightened and there's something that we must do and as he's talking to the, the cops we see that there's professional cops and then we have some kind of rogue people who have on regular masks that they bought from the store and some people have a panda head costume and so you can tell it's people trying to help the cops and then we have the regular cops who are mask cops with the yellow um coverings from the eyelids down. Sabar tells Chief Judd that I just got a warning two hours later after a cop gets shot and I'm just disappointed in it because you didn't communicate with me earlier and he says I know it was just a lot going on and we didn't we needed to analyze what was going on and I figured I could send it to you as soon as we got enough information and she says well while you were doing that I brought in somebody that I feel is part of this white supremacy group and he's ready for questioning so when you're ready i brought who i thought is a part of this group you can you can question them then just keep me afloat of what's going on because it's evident that i can do my own work on the side they put this captured person in a pod which is something that they use in order to question people that they've arrested and they have this gentleman who's already beat up by miss abar as it is and we have another cop or detective that's questioning and asking do you believe that everybody should be taxed are you part of the, of the white supremacist group do you this do you that and he's watching the reaction of this man if he's lying he's watching his eyes twitch when clearly he's viewing these images that are being plastered behind him of swastikas of black people burning crosses racist images and imagery of the typical whitewash america so he's watching his reaction as he's listening to the questions answering the questions and how his body language reacts to all of these different in images in this pod as he's being questioned does he know any whereabouts about this white supremacy group or if he's in it gets out of the pod and he tells the chief and he tells miss abar that look I can tell that he has some racism, but I don't know if he's a part of this group, so we won't really be sure. And Miss Abar can't take that as an answer, and she takes the gentleman in a back room and proceeds to do what she does, and we hear things rustling, and clearly she's whooping his butt, trying to get some answers. And then we see a trail of blood underneath the door, and she walks out, and he, she says, they're at a cattle ranch. So clearly she got the answers that she needed as they get to this cattle ranch they see a lot of different cattle out and the cops are ready to take down whoever is at this post with this group to find out any information that they have more cops start to surround this area and as they surround this area we see that people that are in this white supremacist group they're getting prepared they're emptying out 
batteries that are in watches and they have them in very large quantities, boxes and bags. And we don't know why they're doing this yet. And as they're doing it, somebody clearly spots the cops in, in the ranch area behind the cattle and they begin to shoot with some heavy armory, I mean military guns. And as they shoot, are shooting, they are just chopping up these cows in the field and the cops can't do anything but get down. As they're doing that, the white supremacist group, they are passing out pills to each other and they're saying, go, 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 go. And Miss Abar's character is able to infiltrate one of the trailers. And as she goes in there, she starts to beat up one of the guys and pull off his mask. And when she pulls off his mask, he has a pill that he's showing her on his tongue and he swallows it. So clearly some cyanide or, or some type of pill that will allow you to commit suicide. And after he swallows it, he's foaming at the mouth and she's upset that, man, you know, we could have had somebody that we could have questions, but question, but they have killed themselves. So we know that all of them have this same pill and they got it before they all started to scatter and escape. And also another cop says they have a plane and they hear the plane about to take off. So it's evident that someone is helping this group with military weapons, a plane, um, somewhere to hide in plain sight without being seen. So they're getting some help, not just from where they are in Oklahoma, but clearly on the outskirts of somewhere else. Then see another scene, which was pretty weird. A guy, he's on a horse and he looks like he's somewhere in Ireland. We don't know where he is, but he's on this horse and it's very peaceful. Not anyone around, no people. He gets off the horse. He's in a room that's very uh, rich and luxurious. Um, it looks like a castle or a villa. And when he's in there, he's typing on this typewriter, this old school typewriter. And we, he even has an assistant that's a maid, that's a white lady, and rubbing his thighs, saying, your, your thighs are quite raw from rubbing the horse. And he's like, yes, they're very, they're very raw from me rubbing the horse. And then we see another gentleman that comes in who is a maid. And he says, well, master, we've, we've prepared something special for you. And he says, special? You know, well, why? And he says, well, it's your anniversary master and he says hmm, it is isn't it so they bring him into a room and they've made him a cake and he says well sir did you want a knife and she, he hands him a knife but he says this is a horseshoe <laughs> and he says yes it is isn't it and he's just like would you prefer a knife and he's like no 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 knife so he hands him a fork and he proceeds to taste the cake but when he tastes the cake it's clearly not something that he likes. Maybe there's, it's lacking sugar or something's missing. And he says, yes, that's interesting. <laughs> so they put the cake away and he hands him, one of the maids hands him a watch and it's a pocket watch. And when he hands him the pocket watch as an anniversary gift, he says, well, sir, it was very hard to come by, but I hope that you like it. And he says, yes. This is very nice. I, I really like it. And he stands up and he says, I've been working on a play. And they're like, really? They're so excited and dismayed that they're thought of to be in this play. And he says, well, what will you call it, Master? And he says, The Watchman's Son. Yes. So it's, very, it's a very strange scene, but I'm sure as the series goes along, we'll learn who this mystery man is. We see Chief Judd's family and we see Miss Abar's family. They've joined together to have dinner and you finally see the family start to breathe and talk to one another and have some type of sanity after a very strange, challenging day. And... He says to, uh, Chief Judge says to Mrs. Abar, well, you know, it's a shame that you couldn't accompany, co accompany me to the Oklahoma play. And the husband says, you know, Oklahoma play? She says, well, I didn't, mention, I didn't mention it to you because it's a musical and I know you hate musicals. And she says, well, you know, Chief Judge, you know, you sing a little bit, didn't you? And didn't you play a certain character in Oklahoma? And he's like, no. And everybody's like, well, sing. And he's singing and serenading to the family. So they have a little bit of family time. After dinner, we have Chief Judd and Mrs. Abar and they're talking outside and she says one thing that I noticed that was really weird with the raid 
was that there were bags of lithium batteries. And these are the old school batteries, the batteries that were in watches that people used to wear, but it started to make them sick. So what's that all about? He says, well, those things, you know, I don't think that's any harm. And she says, yeah, to see bags of it and just a large quantity of it, especially on the floor where we had the raid, that's very suspicious. And not even just that, they said that they had a mission and so what are they doing with these batteries? And he says, well, I don't know. And she says, well, aren't you worried? You seem pretty calm. Aren't you worried about this? Aren't you scared? And he says, well, I'm scared out of my mind, but I don't know what they're doing. The wife tells Chief Judd, hey, what are you guys talking about? We need to get home. And she says, okay, I won't keep you, but I just needed to let you know that I thought that was really suspicious and very weird. Chief Judd gets home with his wife and they're trying to have some me time, but he gets a call and it says, hey, you know, Chief Judd, the officer that we have, he's awake now and, you know, it'll probably be a good idea if you come here. And he says, okay, well, if I go, I need to be in the officer's uniform and I need to make my presence known before I talk to this officer. And he says, you know, I'm not going to go by myself, make sure that I have a driver. They're like, yeah, sure. They go on their way to the area where the cop is getting care. And as they're driving, they experience a flat tire. And when they experience a flat tire, they pull over and you can already tell, oh, this doesn't seem good. They pull over and as Chief Judd gets out, he notices not only do they have a flat, but they've ran over a spike strip. So they got the flat tire on purpose. And when he looks up, he is blinded by these bright lights. We then cut to Miss Abar and her husband. They getting down, trying to get, get some love and trying not to wake up the kids. And they are going all in, relieving some stress. <laughs> and she gets a call and she's like, man, you know, who messing up my time with my husband? I'm trying to have a good time. And she gets on the call. And we hear a voice says that, is this Angela? Don't you have a father named Marcus? And she's like, well, who is this? He's like, if this is you, meet me at this location and come without your mask on. And when she goes to lo the location, she doesn't have her mask on. And before she leaves, she tells her husband, here is a gun. When If you see a vehicle pull up in front of the house and it's not me, just shoot. And he has that look like, wow, I don't think my wife just owns a bakery. And he just says, okay, because clearly she knows what she's talking about. And he has to be prepared for whatever is coming. She goes to the location that she heard over the phone. And when she gets there, it's the old man that's in a wheelchair. And when he's in a wheelchair, he points up to the tree. And we have Chief Judd, who has been hanged. And that is the end of the episode. Now, what I find very interesting is that the day and age of what's happening in this series is that they've categorized racism, white supremacy crimes as terrorism. And there is a definite divide of black and white or anyone of color against this group this white supremacy group. Now, I can see that people that are fans of the Watchmen franchise would maybe be frustrated, like, what the heck is this? But as I mentioned in a lot of my reviews, that you have to be open-minded to people who have different interpretations to characters, series, franchises, so to try to give everything a chance. Um, they're interpreting the aftermath of where the comic books end 30 to 34 years after the fact. So this is just centered in Tulsa, the core, the crust uh, characters, where they are located. So we don't know just yet what's going on with the rest of the world. Is it this chaotic or chaotic? Are they having trouble with the, the cops and the everyday uh, threats of terrorism among people. We don't know that yet. I think that this will be a good series going in, not judging and comparing Watchmen movies or the comic books. You can tell that the writers and the director 
want to give their little spin on the what ifs, if this character did this, if this character did that. So I'm enjoying the openness to try something new, which is great. I can tell that with the cinematography and the ideas, we are in for a great series. I love the fact that it is so different and that it's not predictable and it makes like, makes us go, what the heck is going on? What the, What is this? I like that they're not giving us too much information too soon. Um, but we ingested a lot for it to be the first episode. And I like something that's a good mystery. And I like something that I have to put together myself. That I don't have to sit there and say, oh, this is going to happen. I cannot stand a predictable series, a predictable movie. I cannot stand that. So I love that I'm challenged with this series. I'm loving that they have a very seasoned cast of actors and actresses. I'm loving that. I do notice a few of the actors from the Black Mirror series on Netflix, so that's pretty cool. Um, I just look forward to whatever they have in mind for this series. Um, it's only episode one. I look forward to episode two. Let me know what you think. Did you think that this is a total blasphemous interpretation of the DC uh, limited series? Um, what do you think? I think it's great. I think it's something that's a good spinoff. That's a good idea to interpret as something completely different. I am happy that there's another series on HBO that I can watch. Ever since Game of Thrones has been off, I have no idea what to do with myself. Any other series that I watch, it's just a filler until we have the prequels. <laughs> <laughs> for 2020 um but let me know what you think subscribe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any posts and follow me on instagram at the same profile name official bun underscore e i do apologize ahead of time if there are any words or any things that i mispronounced uh, i wasn't for sure sure if it was rojac or rojac uh, I'm from Texas and I can mess up some words. <laughs> so I'll see you guys next week. Also keep in mind and keep an open mind to other series and other reviews that are on my channel. Hit that playlist area so you don't have to search for any, any videos. Just go straight to the playlist. Okay. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.